Right, okay. Right, hey everyone, morning. Um, before we start, hi. Um, just show me some emojis, give me some heart emojis just to make sure you can all hear me okay. Fabulous, great, okay, lovely. Uh, well, it's really lovely to see you today. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world, it'll be one of those three. Um, really great to see you here today, and this is the Making VR Accessible to All session with Chris Lewis. My name is Tim Jackson. I am uh, one of the uh, co-track leads for the Diversity and Access track, along with Anna, who was here a minute ago. Oh, there she is. Uh, along with Anna, who's also the other co-host for, for this event. So thank you very much for turning up today. Um, I just want to tell you a little bit about, uh, about Chris, who's going to be doing the talk today. So uh, Chris, Chris Lewis is an IT lecturer for uh, V College. And uh, essentially, uh, it's a very interesting thing that we start off with here, because uh, Chris tells us that he was going to be a forensic histologist and cut up dead bodies for a living, which is uh, an interesting thing, given that he stood right behind me. Um, so he, he, he wanted to um, keep computing and programming as a hobby originally. He thought it would be harder the other way around unless he became a serial killer. Chris, I, I'm a little bit worried about this now. Um, <laughs> however, fate, fate had other ideas and he ended up combining a love of medicine with computing by reading cybernetics at Reading University. After a brief stint in medical software, he became a lecturer at, in IT at Grantham College, specialising in programming and creating accessibility applications to help students. I have an awful lot more I could tell you about Chris, but actually what I'd like to do is to hand over to him and um, Chris, take it away. Tell us all about Brilliant. you, tell us Thank what you, you do and what right. we're here to talk okay. about today. Well, um, I've been doing uh, uh, virtual reality, if you like, since I was about 16. So um, this has been several years um, because I'm now sort of old and ancient, decrepit. Um, I'm also very much uh, less educated, I suppose, than quite a lot of the people here on their third PhDs. My uh, best achievement, I think, is that I can tie my own shoelaces. But what I'm going to talk to you about today is uh, something that is very important. Um, and we're looking at accessibility uh, within the VR environment. Um, so, first of all, I've got a, a nice picture of a few people with different headsets on. Um, everyone here, I, I hope, is aware of what is meant by accessibility, but unfortunately lots of people think that it's to do with um, disability, etc. And although that comes into it, it's not as important as you might think. Now, here we have a picture of lots and lots of different people in lots of different situations, and that's what accessibility is all about. Um, it might be that certain people have um, uh, a screen such as the guy with the white and black uh, in our sort of middle left uh, of the screen where you haven't actually got any controllers, you're just accessing something almost like in a 2D world but with a 3D environment. You might have uh, head movements like I've got here now or you might not even have that. You might be in a gaming environment, like the little boy who's up in the top corner. So you've got a full gaming headset on, you're going to be doing full body motion, etc. You may be out and about, like the person who's in the top right corner. Or you might just be sort of on a, some sort of mobile he headset um, and just looking at something in a, in a different way. So what's really important is um, we talk quite a lot about inclusion. And um, when we talk about inclusion, um, we should be talking about what's shown in the top diagram there, uh, which is where everybody is actually all together doing the same thing. Um, most things that we see in the real world end up being with people certainly being excluded, segregated or integrated. And you can see hopefully from the diagrams the differences between them. So exclusion, you stop people from being able to access it. Segregation, you give someone a separate space uh, in order to do the same thing that the rest of everyone else can do. But integration, you have sort of a, a subspace, you have sort of an, um, an understanding that some people won't be able to do everything everyone else will be able to do, but they'll at least be able to do something similar. Now, the aim, obviously, is that we should be looking for inclusion for everybody. So how can we do that? Well. 
when I was at uh, Reading Uni, my final year project um, was to build an audio Formula One game. So it was using 3D sound to let people who were completely blind play um, a 3D Formula One going around the track. They could hear where the edges were, etc. Um, what you see here, this blue screen, uh, isn't the actual game, but it is an artist's impression of the game. Um, as you can see, the graphics were uh, non-existent as it used completely 3D sound. Now, when I built this back in many, many years ago, 2001, I saw this as a way of being uh, integrated and inclusive because it allowed everybody to be able to um, play a Formula One game. So um, I was wrong, really. It was completely segregative because actually it stopped anyone who could see actually wanting to play it because all that happened was they wanted to see the, uh, they wanted the flash graphics, etc. What would have been much better, obviously, would be if it was the 3D graphics as well as the 3D sound to allow everyone to play it. So sighted and unsighted people could actually play it together, which would have been much more sensible. Now, before I carry on with anything else, I know you've all got, hopefully, access to emojis and things. Um, now, let me see which emoji. Could everyone put their hand up emoji on, just so I can just double check everyone can A, hear me, and that um, you can actually control your emojis. Fantastic, thank you. Um, what I'd like to ask, on a show of hands first of all, how many people here are actually accessing this talk via a PC rather than a headset? So we have one person over there, two people over there, three people. How many people are using a PC virtual reality device? One person over there. How many people are using a standalone VR device such as uh, the Quest, an Oculus Go or something like that? Now that's a really important sort of aspect of um, inclusivity and accessibility. I personally, I'm using an Oculus Go at the moment, which is why I have one hand that can carry on waving and that's about it. And it's one of the easiest ways of getting into VR, obviously, because uh, you just turn it on, press a few buttons and you're there, rather than having to organize getting your PC working, etc. So all of us are looking at different interfaces, situations and experiences in VR. And that's really what accessibility is all about and how we can try and come up with a conceptual framework for making VR much more accessible for everybody. Talks like this actually are really important as well because they help people like the people who run Altspace to actually understand some of the difficulties that there are actually um, making something like this accessible to everybody. Um, so we have people from all sorts of different time zones, etc. here at the moment. Um, but Oh, let me just go past my slide. There we go. Um, but what we need to remember is that true accessibility is just in a setup that works to the particular environment that you're in. So I'm currently sat downstairs in my kitchen um, at a table. I'm using an iPad to actually run the um, slideshow as well as talking on here. And that kind of works easy enough for me at the moment. But just as easy it would be to be in an office with a laptop and actually doing this with a headset on, talking from a, a computer perspective. So, the first item that I want to talk about is making sure that VR is easily approached or entered. The setup time for an Oculus Go is about 30 seconds, um, which isn't too bad. PC, depends how fast your PC boots. Um, if you're using a PC 3D um, headset such as a Vive, um, you would have to then set all of that up, check the base stations are working. It takes a long time. So getting accessible in VR really needs the systems that we have to be as quick and easy to actually access as anything else. However, there's some other issues as well uh, when you talk about being easily approached or entered. Um, the fear factor is huge. Now, I know a lot of people who are scared of using VR visors. They don't like the um, enclosure of having um, a screen on their head. They can't see the real world. They feel it somehow isolates completely from the real world in a way that actually isn't very um, good for them. It, it makes them feel quite um, uh, intimidated. Um, so there's different ways of being able to access VR that would allow uh, the fear factor to, to subside. One of the main ways would be to be able to actually still see the real world um, while you're in VR at 
any opportunity that you wanted to. So press a button and the cameras on whatever device that you've got or something similar would bring you back into the real world quite quickly. Um, I was talking to someone who was um, deaf recently who was using VR and they wanted me uh, in, in my other life as a programmer to see if I had any suggestions for how they could um, have that sort of uh, access to the real world, if you like, at the same time as being in VR, because um, when they're fighting zombies or whatever it might be that they're doing, they don't want their partner to have to tap them on the shoulder uh, to actually know that there's something they need to do in the real world. So um, we came up with some ideas that would be possible. For example, if someone else was in the room with you, um, if someone else was in the room with you, um, you could do things like um, uh, have them say a keyword, the equivalent of the Hey series and things like that, which is hopefully not going to trigger my, laptop, my iPad, um, so that they could actually talk to your device and say to your device, can you please bring us back to the real world? Or they, as soon as they say that, the game freezes or whatever it is that you're doing freezes and then suddenly you're back, the person's back in the real world and they can have a conversation and then they can continue if they need to. Um, other ways of doing it would be obviously to have a handset controller, a single button which allows you to access then the real world in the same way as you can with the Quest uh, as you go through the Guardian. So something along those lines. Um, so there's quite a few different fear factors that um, prevent people from using VR. Something else that's quite interesting, um, I work a lot with um, students the age range between 16 and probably 35. Um, the people who are most interested in VR are the people from my generation, the people who at the age of 16 in 1996 played on virtuality machines, not necessarily the people who are actually coming up and into the system now. Um, as a show of hands, how many people here are in, I would say, the 25 to 40 age bracket? Most people, or have we got anyone who's in the younger age bracket between sort of 15 and 25? Yep, one person's putting their hand up, yep, and my stepson's putting his hand up, obviously. Uh, <laughs> um, is there anyone who is uh, older than 40 here? So, as I say, it, it looks very similar to the, um, the generation that's actually more interested in VR is actually um, the sort of people who grew up in the analog world in the 1980s, um, moving on to the digital world now. Physical issues then. Um, physical issues are huge for people with disabilities. Um, it's a real shame that Google has cancelled their um, Daydream platform because it was a really useful platform for people who um, were able to uh, access things on a, um, in their wheelchairs without having to worry about the three degrees of freedom, six degrees of freedom. Um, which some of you may or may not be aware of what I mean by that. Um, three degrees of freedom is what I'm on at the moment. I can turn my head in all sorts of different ways, but um, I can't sort of control how tall or how short I am uh, like you can on a Quest. But that's six degrees of freedom. Well, three degrees of freedom is what you get with a mobile headset as well. And that's actually should be, uh, it should be possible that everything that you can access in um, six degrees of freedom, you can pretty much do in three degrees of freedom even if it means a more limited experience, um, because that actually stops people from having problems that might have, um, say, um, uh, cerebral palsy or, or some other condition. Something else that we don't ever see or talk about is VR for people that are completely blind or sp specifically very partially sighted. Um, now, obviously, you may think, why would someone wear a headset if they were almost completely blind? But most of the headsets that we use nowadays, including uh, the Go that I'm on now, have 3D sound capabilities. And I could almost wander around alt space just listening to where people were um, if we're not all magnified with our voices. And I can hear if people are, where people are in relation to myself, if they're on the left of me, right of me, how close or far away they are. There's no other waypoints that we could use in uh, alt space that would allow someone to actually navigate around the environment if they're partially sighted. But those sorts of things could be possible to be added to an environment and then only switched on for those people who are actually have those sorts of issues. Similarly, uh, there should really be a framework for people that have different uh, visual conditions, such as macular degeneration, etc. 
um, so that the screen can actually be altered based on what they can see or what they can't see. And areas of the screen could be actually um, warped and twisted to make it easier for them to have a more full picture of everything that they're seeing around them. Easily obtained. Um, the cost of VR is certainly coming down. So it's becoming more and more accessible to everyone. How many people here have actually got their own VR headset that they're using right now and aren't actually um, accessing it via something that they've got from a college or from an environment where they can borrow uh, a headset? A few of you, most of you. Um, that's all really good, but um, certainly there are some public arcades now available. Um, the nearest um, city to where I live, uh, which is Nottingham, has um, a couple of other VR experiences based in there. Um, the first one being um, a sort of sit-down simulator style ride, and the other one being a full, full sort of warehouse, a bit like um, uh, a completely clear environment that you can actually wander around in with a virtual reality helmet and you can play games in. Um, these sort of public arcades are great for entertainment, but we don't use anything like that for something like a conference like this. Uh, we haven't got like a library somewhere where there's a, a group of people all sat with virtual reality visors on or with a projector on the screen that actually is showing these sorts of items. But do we need these sorts of public environments anymore? Because some of the benefits of VR are that we can be wherever you want to be, perfectly accessible. So when something's as accessible in your home as it is going out into the public for, it makes it much more, more important. Um, easy to share is a huge issue with um, uh, virtual reality at the moment. Now you can all see um, a slideshow behind me that is uh, running inside a browser. What some of you won't be aware of is that each of you are seeing your own version of that slideshow. Uh, there isn't one version that I'm controlling. There is each of you are connected to that same website separately. And as I make a change on one of my webs on the website which is controlling it, it then uh, goes through to changing all the different pages that you guys are looking at. Um, and that isn't very easy to share. So if I was to do something interactive on uh, the board behind me, none of you would actually be able to see what buttons I was clicking or what sections I was going to unless it actually changed the URL of the web page and then it would change for all of you as well. Uh, and that can be quite tricky to allow things, uh, to make things easier for people to share. So that's something else to take in mind when we're looking at building these sorts of VR environments, making things easier to share would be much more simplistic. Now that's not to say there aren't solutions out there. A uh, big screen is a way that people can all go and watch films together uh, in virtual reality. And uh, there was Oculus Spaces, which allowed you to watch live events. But even in all of these sorts of situations, what you are seeing is each person getting a separate stream of that information, rather than just having one, one set of stream of information broadcast to everybody in almost a peer-to-peer -peer way. And that can make things difficult for having shared experiences in VR. Um, it doesn't mean that it's impossible, but it's uh, much more difficult than it is, say, having a few people huddled around on a computer. Um, if we were in a work environment right now and I wanted to scribble some notes on a pad of paper and pass it to one of you, I could do that quite quickly and easily. Uh, to do the same thing in virtual reality is almost impossible. I'd have to have some sort of virtual pad underneath me, a virtual pen to write on that pad, and that piece of paper would then have to be an object in 3D space that I could actually send to somebody. Um, we have systems like Microsoft Teams and Slack which allow people to be um, together in a virtual environment and these should be considered just as um, accessible VR spaces as something that is true virtual reality in 3D in a lot of cases. Now, um, making people easy to talk to. Obviously all of you here are able to hear me, hopefully, fingers crossed. Um, and all of you on, or quite a few of you on different platforms, which makes sense as well. Um, so that's a really useful way of being able to show how technology is moving on. Um, something like uh, Altspace being accessible on PC and 2D mode as well as 3D sets is brilliant. Um, but it's not available on mobile phones or tablets unless there used to be a version on Android. And I was able to pick up the APK actually. Um, for that um, and I was able to run it on my Android device but obviously it's not fit available in any Play stores or anything like that at the moment and it's an old version that's a bit buggy, doesn't work as well. Um, it would be really useful if all these sorts of shared experiences were available in some way for all the different platforms that we have available and there's a group of people trying to do that and make that happen now 
and they call it um, WebXR is the latest version. And WebXR is um, a really uh, interesting environment. Um, the only difficulties I've had with WebVR is um, the speed of actually being able to walk around, etc. Um, on an Oculus Go, it's an underpowered machine. Um, if I spin my head too fast, I get black boxes uh, appear at the sides of my vision and it takes some time to um, build up. So what I'm personally looking at doing at the moment is looking at building an engine which takes uh, WebXR data and actually makes it a bit more efficient uh, built in Unity. Um, I'm not the only person to be doing that. Um, there's a, quite a few companies uh, looking at something called Exotet which does something very similar. Um, but it does actually help things become much more cross-platform if we had a cross-platform language that we could actually build 3D worlds in um, and be able to use on different systems. Um, letting go of the real world is um, difficult, as I've already previously mentioned. Um, you want to still be able to access to the real world as well and have portals almost into the real world. So there's something um, that, you know, there should be almost an, an accompanying app with anyone who's in virtual reality that allows people to be able to talk to them uh, in the real world. For example, um, at the moment I'm getting notifications appearing on an Apple Watch and because of the type of headset I've got, I can actually watch, see my Apple Watch underneath my nose piece. But it would be much more uh, in, useful for me sometimes if my notifications actually came up in here in virtual reality. Again, augmented reality or um, AR um, is going to be something that is probably going to be much more important to people than virtual reality uh, for a lot of situations. Um, having conferences uh, where you can see people virtually floating in front of you and talking to you rather than being completely isolated is probably something that is going to be really important in the future. So, um, there's a picture here that I've got which is uh, an important one. One aspect of virtual reality which is quite well recognised is it being used in hospitals and uh, involved in people where you actually want people to be taken out of the situation that they're currently in. Uh, whether that be PTSD therapy, whether that be um, that they're suffering from burns or something like that, or even having surgery in some cases. Um, there's all sorts of things that you can actually do to reduce pain just by distracting the brain without having to worry about medication. Uh, that's actually an MRI scan of uh, looking at pain related activity and the same individual. Um, they were um, going through um, a, a very hard time with um, third degree burns over 75% of their body. And you can see that when they were uh, immersed actually in an environment, it was um, a, a sea based environment, they were swimming with dolphins, it wasn't interactive, it was just 360 degree 3D videos. Um, they were actually much more happier and uh, without pain than anywhere else. So sometimes this um, ability to be out of the real world is actually just as important as still being able to be in the real world. However, stopping us from doing that is things like intuitive controls. Now, I've got a very, very simple handset in my hand at the moment, as most of you have if you're on the Oculus Go or Quest. Uh, I can move my hand about and it's very, very intuitive-ish uh, for me to be able to put my thumb up or move around on the, so I can teleport wherever I want to just by uh, clicking a couple of buttons. That's great because I've got full access to my limbs. Uh, what happens if I am stuck in a wheelchair and I cannot uh, have no physical control over my body in that way? Um, Microsoft's doing a huge amount of work in accessible controllers and their accessible controller for Xbox is phenomenal. It's the uh, most amazing piece of work for allowing people to actually um, experience uh, the controls, etc., cetera, um, together and play together, uh, no matter what type of uh, physical ailments that you might have. Um, but it doesn't uh, work for everything, and it doesn't work for everybody yet. Um, where are we moving to with intuitive controls um, that would allow people to actually um, use VR in a much easier way? Um, some of the original VR systems actually used to got around a lot of problems by having um, a single dot that appeared in the middle of your screen. Some of you will remember this from Gear VR. And you just highlight over the item that you want to uh, look at or move to. You wait a few seconds for a timer to run and then it would cause that to, to be an action. Um, having that sort of ability would be really useful for a lot of people. Newer headsets are coming up with eye tracking um, so they can actually see where you're looking at. Uh, the main reason that uh, headset manufacturers want that is actually so that they can render things in more detail at the point where you're looking 
and lower detail where you're not to save computing power. But another use of that is that you could actually look at an item and blink or um, do some sort of action and activate that item uh, without actually having to use hands or feet or any other control mechanism. VR obviously is not just for games. Uh, we're proving that hopefully here today. And uh, a lot of conferences uh, could benefit from something like this. Um, there's so many conferences that you have to travel to, you have to go to, um, where you're going to pick up illnesses, which is the big worry that people have at the moment with uh, coronavirus being the, the big boogeyman of today. But there'll always be something uh, somewhere that people are worrying about in terms of picking up something or um, even um, difficulty in ways that um, where they can actually get to an item. Um, there's lots and lots of conferences that might be in a main city that is easy to get to by train or travel uh, if you live in that same country. But if you live in um, a, a different country, if you um, don't have the money or the, the uh, ability to be able to go in those sorts of environments, uh, for whatever reason, um, it stops it from being accessible to you. If you can jump into a conference um, or into a presentation or lecture, especially with education, um, wherever you are, that becomes really, really powerful. Um, I, um, as was mentioned by Tim at the start, I have a system that I call V College. It is not a virtual reality environment. It's a virtual learning environment and it's completely two dimensional. Um, it allows you to um, access all your um, assignments, all your lesson plans, all everything that you might need as a student, as well as as a teacher, um, wherever you are on any device. But it also has accessibility controls built in. So, for example, the font can be changed to a dyslexia font. The colour scheme can be completely changed to whatever background colours or foreground colours that you need for whatever conditions that you might have. But, but also, it allowed me to do live streaming. So every single one of my lessons, as I taught it in a lecture theatre or in a classroom, um, was live streamed on YouTube and was accessible by all the different students that I had wherever they might be. So if they were too poorly to come in for whatever reason, they could still follow along the lecture at home. They could also then talk via a text system to me and actually say exactly what they want to ask as a quest question. And I could then respond in real time through the, the live broadcast. Um, they could also talk to me afterwards on text, so I could then explain things to them. Obviously, the entire live stream was then saved as a recording on YouTube, so that after those, um, the, the lesson has finished, uh, people can actually go back over those items to remind themselves of some of the things that I've talked about, rather than have to worry about referring to notes that might be scribbled, etc. A lot of people struggle making notes, and having that accessible um, at any point actually saves me a lot of work as a teacher because I don't have to go over the same material several times but also more importantly it means that the students can when they're actually going through an assignment they can refer to any of the different uh, lessons that I talked about that assignment and actually um, go back over the information that they went through before. Um, right where uh, are we? So I'm having to look through my nose again We've talked about all of this already, um, but some of the things where we haven't talked about, I suppose, um, are mobility. Now, if I had a, a stable 4G connection, I could possibly be on a train right now. Um, lots of people in a train carriage looking at me very funny, but um, I could be given, given this presentation from a train as I'm on my way somewhere else uh, through a headset and I'm just as experiencing this as, as anyone else but my mobility is fine. If someone has mobility problems, um, they can't necessarily uh, use uh, the same systems that we do. And that really does need to be taken into consideration uh, when we are uh, designing uh, systems. And, and when I mean systems, I mean the software systems. Hardware can be adapted for different people's purposes. But what we need to do is think about when we're making these platforms and software, how we can be as inclusive as possible. Uh, whether that be, uh, as I say, at the moment, um, everyone's seeing the same scene, I think, as, as I am. Um, you're all seeing the same slideshow as I am. But uh, what would be really useful is if uh, those people who need like a yellow background and black writing could actually change my slides as we are speaking to make that happen. Uh, my Vicky College system actually runs over the web and um, I ran a lesson in virtual reality just like this. It was in setting just um, a, a local space and I did actually um, set that up so that my 
main projection that you can see in the background there, people were able to log into with their own settings. And as I moved from slide to slide, they actually had their own settings appearing for them. And nobody else knew about it, because at the end of the day, that's one of the benefits of virtual reality. We can actually alter the environment around ourselves to match what we need as individuals without it actually affecting what the other people in the same environment see or do. Processing speed is a really important one. Now, I talk really quite quickly, especially if it's a subject I'm excited about, passionate about, etc. And some people have problems with their processing speed. Now, with virtual reality working the way that it does, there's nothing to actually stop a program from being able to slow down this entire scene. So we could actually run this entire conference at half speed, for example, or three quarters speed. And so those people who are running at that sort of speed, um, they get like a buffer of information. And as my live broadcast is continuing, they're living through it slower than everybody else that's here, but they can still listen in and take all that information in. A bit like um, a Sky Go box or a Sky Q box, you could actually possibly rewind this presentation if some of you would miss something or pause it, and the rest of this presentation could actually then continue um, for everybody else in the room. But for anybody who wants to be able to um, sort of focus on something else for a short while, just like any form of video footage, they could actually pause it and then bring it back in the, later afterwards. These are sort of really important aspects of communication. Um, being able to uh, communicate in um, multiple languages would be a, a real benefit to VR. Now, how many people here have English as their first language? No, some people haven't. And unfortunately, um, I have to speak in English because I can't speak in any other language. But again, wouldn't it be really useful if there was an automatic translation, either in text base that was, uh, as I talk, I have some subtitles underneath me or a speech bubble above my head, um, just up there, um, so that you'd actually be able to understand what it is that I'm saying. Again, if anyone here was deaf, they'd have no way of knowing what I'm talking about uh, because there's no visual version of any of the words that I'm speaking about actually coming up on screen. There could be um, a live dictation, so showing as a speech bubble, or it could be that even if it wasn't possible to do um, on the fly because it wasn't fast enough, um, having the environment replayable afterwards in the equivalent of a, a virtual video, a 3D video that you can actually walk around in, but with all the um, phraseologies, all the wording either translated or at least subtitled, would be really useful for a lot of people. Now, this is the other part of accessibility. We're talking about VR and we're all in here because uh, we are um, the converted, if you like. We are the people who already know how good virtual reality is simply because we're all interested in virtual reality or we wouldn't be here. And this in itself is possibly a problem. Is this truly the future of uh, education? Is it truly the future of how we move about? Well, there's a, there's a, um, a, a film and a book. Um, I recommend the book over the film, but that's what I would do for most things, uh, called Ready Player One. Um, I wouldn't recommend it as um, a dystopian future that we want to go into, uh, shall we say, but certainly it is a, um, a good example of where we could end up in a virtual environment, especially if uh, the real world becomes more and more horrific for people to, to live in. Um, but is it truly the future? I, I mean, I believe as long as we make things more accessible, that um, being able to teach in virtual reality is um, a really useful um, activity. Um, being able to, say, have uh, this entire lecture theatre filled up with um, students from across the world to all teach the same subject at the same time um, would be really beneficial. And I know I'm not the only one. There's um, a lot of educators out there at the moment who are saying that because of the changes that we're doing with um, communication with our technology, it won't be long before teachers are um, the equivalent of the rock stars of this world, where they're paid an awful lot of money if they're good at their job uh, to be able to teach and educate students from all over the world um, to the best of their ability and to be able to give a, a high level of education to people who wouldn't necessarily be able to um, achieve it any other way. However, we are all in a bubble. Um, if you're in a, um, uh, a Twitter uh, feed like I am, most of my Twitter feed has everybody uh, really interested in virtual reality. Um, this is mainly because um, the cipher people that I follow um, 
and therefore I'm in a bubble and by looking at my feed everybody in the world loves virtual reality that must be true luckily I'm nicely grounded uh, by my partner um, who hates virtual reality she's um, not a technophobe but she certainly doesn't like the fact that um, uh, this is so um, intrusive if you like in becoming isolating um, so I'm able to understand things from a bit of a different perspective and see well maybe sometimes the best answer for virtuality isn't necessarily to wear a headset like this I'm doing now but maybe a 2D environment I um, said about it earlier which generation likes it most um, I was actually quite surprised that most of my students are not interested in virtual reality in the way that I thought they would be um, certainly I was more of a driving force into it than, than the students themselves. However, having said that, as soon as they start experiencing what they can do in virtual reality, things change. Um, and I think for a lot of people, they um, are very, very limited in what they think virtual reality can actually do for them and what they feel the environment's actually like. Um, and they're not aware of some of the advantages of virtual reality. However, with the younger generation that have grown up with Pokemon Go, virtual um, AR devices on their phones, etc., I think it's going to very much be that AR becomes their first environment rather than VR. And so VR will be um, a secondary environment to AR. Whether that's a good thing or not is uh, a matter of opinion. Personally, um, I think any form of inclusion, any form of um, accessibility to help people um, in environments to be able to achieve what they need to achieve uh, and, and do what they need to do is uh, important rather than the technology that's being used. So, quick conclusion then, we need to get buy-in from the public for virtual reality and the only way you can do that is to make it accessible for everybody. Uh, it doesn't matter how old you are, how young you are. Um, it shouldn't mean that you have to wear a headset and be isolated from the environment around you. It shouldn't stop you from being able to use virtual environments and making things in such a way that you will actually be um, uh, happy to be in the environment that you're in. There are a lot of positives to virtual reality and the best way to get by is to show the positives it makes to their lives. Um, when I uh, first started my experiments in um, live streaming my lessons, um, I may have had um, one person, um, it all started with one person who was too ill to attend lessons for a short period. By the time um, last year, I had um, two members of the class who were on long-term sick, who were still able to attend every lecture. Um, and uh, both of them actually went to achieve um, uh, distinction uh, uh, qualifications uh, in their um, HMDs, which they would not have been able to pass at all if it hadn't been for the ability to show them, look, this sort of virtual communication is really important. Um, we're currently in what's called the lead time for virtual reality. We're still at the start point of a, a graph of uh, getting people to be interested. Um, the Quest has been an amazing success uh, this Christmas time. Um, it was out of stock everywhere. They can't make them fast enough. And it's items like these, hardware like these, I see as the future of virtual reality rather than um, having to attach it to clunky PCs. People today, especially young people, are not using PCs. They're using phones, they're using tablets. Um, there's a company called Enreal who's just made a augmented reality uh, set of glasses that work with uh, Android uh, phones that um, in less than two months now will be um, selling to the public for I think about £300 or $300. Um, that's going to be a huge massive part of the, the next generation if you like of virtual reality. Uh, but the most important thing I think we all want to make sure of is that this doesn't end up being yet another 3D TV. Um, I'm quite, um, I've never owned a 3D TV as much as I'm interested in technology, however I'm really pleased that they existed because it seems I've got a lot of 3D films now that I can watch on my Oculus Go. Um, however, 3D isn't necessarily the answer for everybody and we don't want 3D TV's legacy, if you like, to taint virtual reality and augmented reality. To make that happen, we need to be inclusive and we need things to be accessible. And that's it. So, um, any questions? That's great. Thank you so much, Chris. That was a really interesting presentation. Can we just have some clapping emojis for Chris, please? <laughs> Thank you. That was awesome. Fantastic. It's quite interesting that you were talking about um, that the first point that you felt you needed to do this was when you had um, a member of the class, a student off sick. And it's quite interesting because I had that experience myself this year. Um, and oh, wow. we happened to be doing a virtual reality session. 
and uh, consequently I was able to include that student and, and in fact afterwards they said how much that they'd enjoyed the session even though they weren't there and were really glad that they were able still to join. So this is a really powerful technology that we can use and, and it is going to it allow is. for a greater level of exclusion, uh, inclusion rather. I think I think you're right. There's um, there's another aspect to this actually with robotics. Um, originally, my idea was um, I've got a little Cosmo robot, uh, which has a camera built in, and I wondered if there was any way that the student could actually integrate with the class through a robot. And I know there's a lot of other companies doing that same sort of idea, but these uh, robots are astronomically expensive. I mean, you're talking two, three thousand pounds for a small robot that rolls around on a desk that actually in terms of hardware isn't very expensive to build. Something like virtual reality is more inclusive and easier to actually run with than buying specialist equipment than anything else, which is why virtual reality, I think, works better than having robots. But as long as the people who are in that space, i.e. the people in the classroom, can still interact with that student and not isolate them as well. Exactly, exactly. Uh, and I, I think your, your point you made about augmented reality being the next leader, if you like, I think you're absolutely right. And I think where we are with virtual reality now, I think another 18 months, that's where we're going to be with augmented reality. And it's going to be very Fingers interesting crossed. how those, yeah. yeah, it's very interesting how those technologies are going to mix and how that's going to have an impact on um, not just inclusion, but diversity and inclusion as well, uh, and, and what yes. the potential issues could be in relation to that. So fantastic. Thank you so much. That was a, a great presentation. Mm -hmm. More more clapping emojis, please, for Chris. That's great. <laughs> Thank you. Right. OK, so what I'm going to do now, I'm going to turn on um, the ability for you to ask questions. Now, the way to do that is you should have now had pop up uh, on your screen a raise hand uh, uh, emoji, bar, emoji a, raise, a raise hand option, actually. <clears throat> and um, all you need to do is if you want to ask a question, just press that raise hand option and a little hand will come above your head and then I can uh, come and unmute you because you're all still muted at the moment. And uh, that way you can then ask your question. So if you want to ask Chris a question, please put your hand in the air and then we can ask you and then you can um, be unmuted so that you can ask your question. So would anyone like to ask a question to Chris, please? No questions at all? Okay, while people are thinking of, no, of no. Uh, a question, I, I was <laughs> going to say, Chris, it's... Um, Yes. This is a fascinating subject. I think it's something that needs a, a lot more research. I, I think does, trying, yeah. to, trying to define what we mean by inclusion and diversity, whether that be uh, based on a uh, physical uh, issue or a mental issue or sexuality or gender, which is basically what the diversity and access track is all about. It's a very difficult exactly. thing to do. Uh, and I think it's very easy to be able to exclude people by accident and... and and not necessarily think of every possibility. And that, that's incredibly difficult for hardware and software developers and for members of the public as well. What, what would you say I mean, about that? Yeah, I mean, take, for example, we're in all space at the moment and we've all got um, a, uh, um, an avatar that we've made ourselves and we've decided to style either on ourselves or on somebody else. It doesn't matter. We, we can style it however we like. However, um, as you may notice, all of the avatars still have all four limbs. Uh, all the avatars are able-bodied. There's no um, avatar that's in a wheelchair. There's no avatar where I could say, well, actually, I haven't got a left arm, so could I remove my left arm, please? Um, certainly, some of those sorts of items would actually make things more inclusive, I think, for a lot of people that want to be able to uh, express themselves exactly how they are. Um, I can't... Uh, I've got a limited set range of options for clothing, etc., but that could be actually a useful thing because it means that you can end up with more of a uniform for a virtual reality and therefore not exclude uh, people that there shouldn't be. Language, I still think, is a big issue. Um, having um, an equality in uh, the diverse languages that people in this room probably are saying and speaking, having the ability maybe to um, translate automatically or have people translate would be useful. Uh, similarly, as I said before, it'd be really useful to have some sort of speech bubble above my head as I'm speaking that would let people see what there is, or even um, sign language. Um, 
something like um, uh, British Sign Language is very different to American Sign Language, but it could be that you could have a virtual avatar that is able to actually show what I'm saying in sign language without there having to be an actual physical person doing those sign language translations. So um, there's a lot of things with equality and diversity um, that uh, we can standardise uh, an experience such as this, but we need to make it in such a way that it's flexible for every person to be able to use and mm. change how they perceive it. Yes, but without that's, that's the key, isn't people. it? Yeah, it that's is. the key that they, they can then change that. it to them, suit them. Yeah, exactly. uh, it's interesting. It, it, in a talk the other day, uh, somebody was talking about the use of uh, haptic technology to be able to uh, allow for Braille to be used in virtual reality because with yes. the haptic feedback, yeah, you can then feel the bumps. Um, and I thought, actually, I hadn't thought about that. I thought that was a very interesting, you know, uh, concept. Yeah, yeah sorry. one of the places I, no, no worries. Um, when I was doing virtual reality back in 2001, the, the most up to date virtual reality system was called Cave Environment. And it was very different to what we use now. It was um, basically four projectors that projected into a room, and you had a pair of 3D glasses that tracked where you were so that you could actually wander around this room and see things in 3D. Um, while that was all really good, you obviously couldn't feel anything. So what they actually came up with was um, little air balloons that you could put in your hands on a series of gloves. It was very, very cumbersome. It didn't work very well. But as you came and approached a, an object, such as a wall or something like that, they would inflate so you could actually feel the physical object in 3D space. Now, if you are blind and you use, say, a, a, a white stick that you're sweeping across the floor to actually work out where you are, you could have actually used something like that in virtual reality and still experienced the 3D virtual space without having to be able to see uh, with some sort of haptic technology in that way. So again, having that sort of inclusion, it, we, we focus very much on how things look uh, in computing generally. Um, and uh, that does exclude quite a, a large proportion of people. Especially, I mean, yes. even virtual reality glasses with uh, glasses wearers are, are very difficult. Yeah. Um, but as we're becoming an ageing society, um, the focus should actually be more on how we can include people in ways that doesn't necessarily affect their vision. Okay, uh, that's interesting. I mean, I, I think part of the, the thing that I would also think about, sorry, I keep teleporting everywhere. Um, no. Part of the issue that I can see is um, we have limitations of bandwidth at the moment. So we all know that in the UK, yes. for example, there are many areas that are still having problems accessing the internet at a half decent speed. So if we're now talking about using virtual reality on a larger scale with this level of, of uh, diversity and integration, that's going to take more bandwidth. If we're already struggling trying to download a web page, how much more difficult is it going to be to be able to build these systems into a virtual reality environment? Actually, it's going to be simpler than the video issues that we have at the moment. Um, that's one of the big benefits of virtual reality. Uh, in 2003, I looked to create um, a new games for myself. Uh, never been anywhere, and um, so you start the idea of it being possible, so it gives you an idea of what it looked like. Um, but one of the ideas of that that I had was uh, things like football matches. Uh, now, back then, we didn't have 3G. It was all 2G mobile. Um, and the idea was that if you had all the characters from a football game, as in all the, like a 3D game, downloaded to the device that you got, uh, all you actually need to track is the location of all the people in the ball, uh, and you could actually watch the, the game in 3D and move around that 3D environment as you wish uh, for very, very low bandwidth. And it would be the same for something like this. At this very moment in time, um, the entire scene that we're sat in, uh, this entire uh, auditorium, has been downloaded to each of our computers. It isn't being streamed across the internet to each of us separately. All you're being given is um, a small amount of information about where each person stood, where their hands are, and uh, unfortunately a large amount of information with the voice. But um, it's still much, I mean, this would actually work on a, a 3G environment rather than even 4G uh, as a connection platform. Right. Uh, whereas you could, certainly couldn't do that on, say, uh, an iPlayer style video stream, which would require much no. higher bandwidth. So with a lot of um, careful thinking and, and careful preparation, you would actually be able to create a virtual environment which works for very low bandwidths. That's interesting. All right. Thank you very much. We do have a question from uh, Holorus. So... Uh, just unmute you there, Holorus. Just one second. It's have you got yourself muted, Holorus? Because it's not it's not allowing me to unmute you. Let me try. 
Right, if I do that. Holoros, are you able to hear me? No, okay, he's disappeared, oh, so he, he, he won't be asking you a question then. <laughs> I mean, as it happens, we're, we're almost out of time anyway, but um, that was a, a fascinating presentation. Thank you so much, Chris. Uh, can we give worries. Chris uh, clapping emojis, please? Thank you so much. That was great. And, and it, it actually highlights some really important issues that I, I don't think have been given enough consideration yet. So that was fantastic. Sure. Thank you. Thank um, you, Chris. Thank you. Okay, can you hear me, Hello. I can. Hello. Thank okay, you. hello. <laughs> Great presentation, by the way. I had some technical issues the first 10 minutes. Oh, no worries. <laughs> I'm okay now. Okay. That's good. Thank you. Okay, just, just to let you know, folks, that this is the end of this session now, but coming up in just a few minutes' time, so in about 10 minutes' time, uh, there are two sessions coming up. So uh, one is under the medical and science uh, track, and it's called VR for Elderly and Dementia by Suzanne Lee. And then in one of the other rooms, we have a special event with Mark Christian, and he's going to be talking about mixed reality in classrooms near you. So both really interesting sessions. Please stick around for, for one of those or jump into the other room if you want to go to the other section. But I thank you very much for, for coming today and listening to Chris and fantastic presentation. Lots of heart and hand emojis, please. Thank you for Chris. That's great. Thank you so much and have a great day, everybody. Thank you.